Yeah, it's very, well, it's all bending down. How about we do this? Good job, that's Andrew. It, that's it. Wow. <laughs> Never mind. Andrew, smartass. Okay, so uh, let's let's get it on uh, let's get it on the camera. Okay, so here we go. Um, that's all different. No question about that. Um, looks like we got plenty of foam. Looks like they've uh, basically glued everything in here. Now these are where the um, the screws that were holding it in place were mounted to, and this is basically what was holding it back. I don't think this blue um, adhesive um, was our big problem. I think it was the ends of these PIM nuts. This right here um, is a RTV, and um, that's kind of like what we use for sealing and gluing things. This looks like an anaerobic, which means that when I put it on, It'll stay wet forever until I put something over the top of it, screw it down, and then because there's no air, that's when it'll cure. This, this, clue, this cures in atmosphere. So you put that on around the intersections on the top surface, I think, and then you put this RTV on, then you put everything together, and when you do that, this center section here is where they start riveting or sorry screwing everything down once everything is screwed down and there's an absence of air then this thing will adhere this is a crash zone <clears throat> so out here i'm bolted this is being bolted to the uh, longitudinals um some people call them the rockers in the olden days they call them the rockers but that's really the um, strength of the body is going in here and then you've got this gap. And this gap is to prevent intrusion from a side impact. You can see by the outside circles, these are 4680s for sure. I have no idea how they made it so nice and smooth, but I'm guessing that on top here, you've got some sort of a mica or something cover. And uh, what they've done is they've pressed it down, wiped it off, and that's where, these, um, that's where these little green spots are coming, coming through. But it does look like this has been laid and then the, <clears throat> whatever that green stuff is has come out and then they've kind of like swiped it. And you can see that. It looks, it looks kind of like uh, what you'd see or expect to see if you were having your walls plastered. I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at some things that are similar to what we saw in the past and other things that mm, I am totally um, baffled at. So that's it for now. Hey boys and girls, welcome back to uh, Monroe Live and I'm here with Tom Prache. And what we're gonna do today is talk a little bit more about the battery. Um, the battery is a little unique but there's some features and functions and one little story that we're gonna give you about water ingress. And, um, and uh, I think with that, maybe what we'll do is uh, jump right in and start, uh, start talking. So uh, first thing I wanna do is I wanna tell all those people who are worried about me getting, you know, dying because I don't have gloves on. Um, if we look up here, there's a, this green, sea foam green foam that's over the top of this. And then underneath, you can see that orange looking uh, plate. That's a chunk of plastic. There's energy contacts underneath there. But in order to get a shock, I'd have to be able to have all that sea foam taken off, those plastic things taken off from there. And then I'd have to have these all removed with the sea foam gun and the bus bar available. And then I would have to reach from here all the way over to there in order to get contact. And that's the only way you can get a, any kind of a major poke. If I really wanted to die, I suppose if I could reach all the way over to there and that was uncovered and this was uncovered, then I could get the full potential of the battery. But I'm not gonna do that today. In fact, I'm not gonna touch anything. 
Tom's got yeah. his gloves on for those people who are still worried and, um, and uh, he'll touch stuff, but he won't get a shock either. Today's video is sponsored by Weagle. Hey boys and girls, welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm here with Aaron Weagle uh, from Weagle Solutions Manufactured. And believe me, I'm sure this is gonna be a great tour. Anyway, Aaron, can you give us a little background, a little something on you and tell us a little bit about the company? Sure. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Aaron Weagle, President and CEO of Weagle, formerly known as Weagle 2 Works, and we just recently dropped that acronym because of all the different capabilities that we now offer our customers. Uh, we're a third generation owned business. Um, our, we're, my brother, sister, and I are the third generation. My grandfather started it back in 1941 as a tool and die shop, and over the decades and generations, we've evolved from a tool and die shop to a metal stamping facility to now just doing a lot of different manufacturing with the, manu with the stamping emphasis. Today, we do a lot of patented row welding processes, uh, assembly processes, and uh, we're, we're into molding now in, in some cases. So um, just a lot going on here because we wanna make sure that we are providing everything that the customer is looking for as a one-stop shop place as we start to grow and add on additional capabilities and, and expand our footprint, not only in Chicago, but now heading into Mexico in 2024. This is a patented welding process that we co-developed with two other partners in the United States to be able to produce the products that we're making for our customers. Custom machines, and we're about to show you a little bit of what this thing does, but I, as an example here, we're marrying two different aluminum materials together to form, to produce a, a welded component here. So here's the after and this is the before. So as you see, the parts are being moved from station one to two, two to three, three to four. And then the robot will introduce a new piece here. And that process will continue as we start the automation process. So the robot to your right, is locating the, the flexible circuit board, removes the, the backing to expose adhesant, use a vision of the system to check whether or not it's a positive or negative flex circuit board, locates it on the frame, applies it. So this is empty tray. So once this is full, it'll come out. Yeah. We put a top on it and that's the final stage is where it's, it's the operator's responsibility to, to get the, a full skid out and keep a, always an empty, or a, a empty trays yeah. of a full skid ready to go in queue. So anyway, what we're looking at is one of the pieces that's coming out of this minster here, the 160 ton thing. So we're looking at, we're looking at, I don't know, uh, some sort of a connector or, or contactor. And this is like amazingly thin. Over here, this is our 350 ton minster. And what we're stamping out here is a thin gauge, well, I would say medium gauge, uh, copper based material with tin plating once more. And this is a, a thinner gauge bus bar. Where is that done? On this front? So we have a post operation on this particular part where we're putting time insertions into these, into these parts. Some of that can be done off press and some of it can be done in die. So we do, we have both, we have both applications. Really, if you're gonna do it in die, it really depends on the part design, which may or may not allow us to be doing it in die. So welcome to our wire EDM department at, at Weagle. So this is really part of the process of how we make all of our progressive dies within our, our facility. Everything is all designed and built at Weagle. And as far as the precision and where the, the most important part of the process is when it comes to making our tools, starts right here. This is a climate controlled room, 68 degrees once again year round. All these are MITS brand wire EDM machines. Typically we like to flip our machines every five to seven years because the technology on these machines change so quickly and just they so much improve, whether it's just um, the speed of the machine itself or even the, uh, the wire consumption. All right, well, um, I have never seen one of these. Yeah, it, I, I'm not uh, surprised. Well, this is brilliant. Aaron, I have had a hell of a good time. <laughs> I gotta tell you, and I don't get stumped too many times. You got me twice. So um, I'm really impressed with all the stuff you've got going on here. Um, I've just had an amazing afternoon. This has been really, really wonderful. 
So thank you very much for allowing us to come here and uh, and, and and basically vi videotape all this stuff. Thanks for uh, educating me on a couple of new techniques I've never seen before. And uh, just in general, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you. Sandy. I appreciate thank you coming on. I appreciate yeah. you coming and seeing what we got going on here. I mean, our family and our and our staff are really proud of what we've accomplished. And to be able to showcase that is great. So, um, and especially on on your show, it's been uh, <laughs> it's got a lot of notoriety, and we feel proud and that we can even be here. So, if you want to find more information about Weagle, it's uh, www.weagle.com. And uh, again, thank you for everything from my thank family, you. you know, to yours. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. There'll be more coming up in the near future. Bye. So the, probably one of the easier things to do is to talk about this relative to the Model Y that we tore yeah. down that was very similar in, in methodology. Uh, the first thing that's different is that it's, it's somewhat upside down, but we'll touch on that later. Regarding the cooling ports, normally we have a single serpentine cooler that fishes its way through the cells, uh, like a snake, if you will, and it would cool the edges of two rows of cells. What Sandy's pointing out is that very oddly, we have one of those cooling channels on one edge of the cell. So this, without any other type of intervention, would cause this row of cells to be cooled a little bit better than the other ones that all have two groups of cells sharing the same pipe. So that said, they may have put a flow restrictor in there to equalize it. They may have some other way of making it so that it isn't disproportionately cooler or hotter, depending on what you're trying to do with the coolant. I think it might be a header, um, in, in which case a header is just something, one pipe that's a little different than the other pipes, it's a little bit bigger. And uh, it could be that, you know, they just need uh, flow back or flow forward um, and they couldn't achieve it with the, uh, with the other pipes, so they stuck that in. It could very well be, and it yeah. is common in battery design where you have multiple coolant paths to try to equalize the flow through yeah. those paths, and oftentimes a flow restrictor is what you do. You have a flow monitor that allows you to adjust the restrictors until you get an even flow down every channel the way you want, and then of course how much flow you want is a function of a computational fluid dynamics study that we won't get into right now. Mm, um, good. But <laughs> yes. I'll put everybody to sleep this early exactly. in the video. Exactly. <laughs> so from there, uh, there's other similarities. Um, the uh, orange piece that Sandy alluded to earlier, this is a plastic cover that goes over a bus bar. So if you look real close here, these are bus bar connections to a, a greater conductor here, and it passes through this channel and connects to this one. So on that far end, there's an electrical terminal that goes down into the penthouse. And again, this battery pack is upside down relative to the way it is in the car. So the penthouse is usually pointed up, but that electrode starts one terminal of the battery. It comes down this way, connects this way, goes that way. And then there's another terminal at the other end of this module, another terminal at the end of this module that connects this array through this bus bar and then back to there where the last terminal gives you your full voltage potential. So that full voltage potential would be seen at the far ends of these two modules with the electrode pointed down into the penthouse. You know what, maybe what we should do, because I, I've gotten these questions before, why don't you describe um, the difference between series and parallel uh, voltages? Okay, um, so. Because that, that way people might better understand why it is that this lump um, is basically one half of a battery, and this is one half of a battery. It's also half the voltage. So, why don't sure. you go in there? So, to, to start out fundamentally, the entire array would give you an 800 volt pack, which by very definition doesn't mean 800 volts very often. It means a range of voltages that's probably 600 to 900 voltages during its operating voltage range. So that said, how does that break down? It breaks down in groups of series cell groups. So depending on what your total voltage is, you'll have you know, a standard pack might be 96 groups in series. This one's significantly more. We haven't tried to dive in yet to figure out exactly what this electrical configuration is yet. Um, but each cell group is formed by a parallel grouping of cells. And by parallel, I mean the positive terminals tied to the positive terminal next to the, the 
to the next cell and negative is tied to negative. So when I take five, six, seven, eight of those and put them in parallel, I can get more power, but the voltage remains the same within that group. But that group is then grouped with other like groups to form the series array that gives you your high voltage. So we call that in the biz, S's and P's. So, um, you know, 96S, 9P, I think was the configuration for the Model Y. This is a lot more S's and probably quite a few uh, fewer P's, if you will. How many batteries do we have in here? Did you check um, that out? The, there's a little bit of mystery in counting. I've counted 48 along the length, but it's kind of hard to tell whether or not we have a cell underneath these areas oh, back yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So once we get dug into this area, we'll be able to uh, definitively determine how many there are per row, but it looks like 48 if there isn't one hidden under here. So that would be 48 times seven rows, and four of those collectively would give you the total number of cells. So there's For your homework assignment, <laughs> boys and girls. <laughs> now, if they only knew the cell voltage, they could yeah. figure out how many there are in series, and that's one of the things I'll yeah. use to confirm our analysis as a, an actual cell measurement. Hmm which we can get to once we dig it down in here. We can, there should be a battery management module underneath here that has all the connections for all the cell groups because they need to be monitored as individual cell groups. And if we can get at that, I can measure every cell group voltage from one connection on this end. Cool. So, well, let's go back to the coolant. Yeah. So, um, the arrangement for the cooling is a little interesting here. We have an inlet and an outlet on each of these cooling channels. So there's one that's sort of high here and one that's sort of low, and that is consistent with what we saw with the Model Y. Um, but what isn't totally obvious at this point is how they are plumbed, again, in terms of S's and P's. How many of these are plumbed in series and how many of them are plumbed in, ser in parallel? I want to believe they're all in parallel, but so far visual observation has not confirmed that. So mm. we'll dig into that and figure out exactly how it works and then report. But the, the connectors themselves look really similar to the, to the Model Y. It is. The, the connection <clears throat> and the, the entire header at the end of the serpentine cooler looks to be similar to the Model Y. So um, that said, here's your main coolant inlet and outlet to the pack. And, you know, this um, pack is organized with the four modules that are electrically modules. Quite obviously, they're glued in place in such a way where you could not remove them as a module, at least not in any sort of normal way, and let alone replace that module. When we think of modules in a battery, we think of something you can remove as a subset of the total number of cells, and you could even replace that and put a new section of cells back in it. This has obviously gone away from that. That design would be what we would call cell to module, module to pack. This one is cell to pack, no module implied. Yeah. However, electrically, it's still very much a module. It, it still has to behave that way, and there still has to be a battery management system monitor at the end of that <clears throat> to read all the cell voltages, cell group mm -hmm. voltages, and is, provide the balancing function and ultimately report their information back to a supervisory battery management system that would manage contactor control, pre-charge, and other features like that that the battery So this has. is truly um, a structural module. Th that's why we're calling it, uh, that's why we're skipping the other two aspects because we're basically looking at modules and one gigantic uh, piece of sheet metal and these things are all glued down solid, rock solid. There's very little reason, or very little hope for replacing anything unless you just take this out and put another one in. So um, about the rock hardness of that, it is really hard. Yeah. And it's structural accordingly. Um, it provides a number of different functions. Um, everything from thermal runaway risk mitigation, all the way to the structural component where you do have to mount the seats and other passenger, passenger compartment components on what is the top side of the battery down below. So between that and vibration damping, um, managing the otherwise rather frail uh, welded connections between the current collectors on the far sides of these cells. By the way, it may not be obvious, but we're looking at the bottoms of the cells here. 
the tops, or where you would make the electrical connections to the cell, is on the far side that you can't see. So the idea would be the bottom of the cell is the vent. If a cell were to let loose in a thermal runaway situation, the bottom of the cell would push out. It would poke through this mica top. You can see that it's mica. Um, and it's very brittle. The bottom of that cell will push right through it like it's nothing. And that being the case, that turns this whole area into a vent trough, if you will. And in the Model Y, we had these little plastic ABS pieces that provided that same functionality. That's gone. And but the capacity is much bigger. Yeah. It's what's much better is this. Yeah, um, let's talk about this. This is really, uh, let me put it back yeah, together. Yeah, let me, let me give the story leading up to that. So yeah. ventilation capacity is a big thing <clears throat> in battery design. Um, when a battery starts to go into thermal runaway, it's like, you know, hundreds of Roman candles that go off in a, in a sequence. So that being the case, um, where do the gases go? They have quite a lot of volume and you have to get them out of the vehicle. So they have a number of different ways they've done it in this design. We can talk about flood ports second, but this is the most interesting piece of the design that I've encountered so far. These pieces were mounted here in what we would call the lid, but it's actually the bottom of the battery. And they sit sandwiched like this. I won't try to fit it together, but you get the idea where they sit. So what's interesting is on this side, you have a Gore-Tex style vent, which is a moisture membrane. It's meant for low volume pressure equalization. This battery has to be able to go to different altitudes and you have to equalize the pressure and you don't want to bring moisture in when you do equalize the pressure. So this little membrane that you can see inside there provides that sort of filtered functionality to keep the moisture out. That being the case, that is nowhere near enough ventilation capacity for this entire group of cells to let loose through. So what did these smart guys do? They created this thing. When we went to take these off, there was no obvious way to remove it without breaking it, and they snapped. These little tangs, all four of them, broke when it came apart. Why would you do that? If you look at this surface area and you calculate how much it is, and the pressure that you would want it to release at, you can design these little tangs so that they break at a precise point, at which point this piece pops right off the bottom of the car, and what's left is this fancy little device. Without a better name for it, I'll call it a spark arrester. When a battery goes into thermal runaway, one of the conditions that people are most worried about, you know, it's bad enough you've got a flammable gas, and eventually it might catch on fire, and now it's bad, worse yet, you have flames. The only thing worse than that is a projectile that comes with the flames. And that can happen in certain battery chemistries where there's particles that come out that can blind people, start fires uh, in adjacent areas and such. So this, as a spark arrester, would capture those particles and give you a tremendous amount of ventilation capacity once this cap's removed. So an innovative thing that we normally see done with an elastomer sort of mushroom valve, a, a check valve device that opens under pressure and then closes after that pressure is relieved. This is a rather one-way valve that's, you know, only one way once. <laughs> but, but here's the thing, um, even though uh, we're looking, we should talk about this as well. So this is the bottom, oh, sorry, that's the bottom of the, um, of the battery pack and it is facing the, uh, the, the dirt, as it were. This and this are kind of unique because here we've got this standoff and this is an off-road vehicle. So in off-roading, anybody that's done that knows that sooner or later you're gonna run over uh, a log or a big rock and it's gonna bang into the bottom of your uh, uh, of your floor and when that happens um, you're going to have a dent you're never going to pierce it but you'll definitely get a dent this has got this looks like about 25 millimeters plus another I don't know six six or seven millimeters over there so what you're looking at is over 32 uh, I, I think 32 33 millimeters of crush zone that I've never seen anybody do before, but I, I think it's brilliant, and it does two functions. One, it gives you, as Tom just said, a big area for the gases to, uh, to uh, vacate to, and, um, and two, 
uh, this, this allows me the comfort of going off-road and not having to worry about if I hit a big rock or uh, a, a tree stump or something like that. So this is a really clever bunch of ideas, but even cleverer, cleverer, is there a word like that? I don't there think so. There is now. There is now, yeah, I just invented it. Let's talk or let's have Tom talk about these babies because I'm really impressed with this. So this one comes out of the, um, uh, the um, uh, control module, and this one is parked right in in back of you somewhere. All right, so let's talk about this one here because it's familiar. Anyone, yeah, who's, uh, anyone who's actually um, watched our videos has probably seen this thing. It has an official name, it's called a flood port. If you look inside, and it's really hard to see, there's a stack of wafer disks that are inside there that would absorb moisture should it come in contact with moisture. And once it absorbs the moisture, it gets thicker and they collectively get thick enough where a valve opens up and it's an exit for coolant to leave the penthouse. So these sit in here like this. And if the coolant leaks in the battery penthouse up here, this is the upper side, then it'll find its way to the flood port expand those discs, open it up, and hey, you'll see uh, a coolant leak on the floor of your garage and you'll know to get it fixed. So that's the most probable reason you would have this. Um, they did a similar thing out here at the edges and you can see the holes where they were at. So this is a new type of valve that we've not seen before, but it is also a stack of wafers with a little uh, mechanical coil spring. And this little centerpiece is a, a, the place where the, the gases can okay, ex exit. Yeah, you have fingernails available, I don't. Mm. So you can see so the discs. So here we go. Here's the discs here. And these things expand, like uh, Tom just said, with, uh, with fluid. And um, that would allow that top to come out. And because really and truly everything here is this, so when, you're, when the water comes, gravity will just let it drip out. And the same with this one here it's pointing downward yeah, same sort of a deal so it would go out through this hole so if you had a flood situation where the water was accumulating underneath at the bottom of the pack if it got high enough to hit the flood port it would let the moisture out through that hole yeah. so it also gives a little bit of additional ventilation capacity because pressure on this side will open this little thing and it will allow some of those uh, flammable gases to exit out here, but obviously this is not enough capacity for such a huge battery and hence yeah. the importance yeah. of the other one that you saw. So what's always interesting about these is the talk about uh, will they close back up again? But uh, we'll save that for another time. Uh, yeah, interesting flood port addition. Uh, this is very obviously designed for off-roading applications where it's gonna get wet. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of this before, but the vehicle has a so-called scuba mode where it's designed to be able to go water fording. And to facilitate that, the air compressor that operates the uh, air suspension on the vehicle has an airline that feeds into the battery pack that pressurizes this as a cavity so that if it has any minute leaks, such as what could be a breach in one of these seals or a valve that's cocked or whatever, that can become an outlet for that pressurized air that was put into the pack so that it doesn't become an inlet for moisture. So it's a really brilliant idea that I would argue should be on every car. Um, uh, every electric every car, EV, anyways. Of course. Yeah. So at the end of the day, these are all great things uh, that I think Tesla has put in place. But um, we, we do some work for other agencies, and um, we did some work on... Um, flooded vehicles. And one of the things that uh, Tom found out was that there was a, uh, um, a lady or s someone anyways in Florida and they backed up their jet skis using uh, a Model X or yeah, jet skis, X, right? And, was it and jet um, uh, they went in a little too far and it submerged the car. And that's happened before, but what I've never heard of is what Tom's going to tell you about right now. Yeah, so I went down to look at this car and, you know, a little background on it. There is uh, YouTube videos of this car burning underwater where it spent four and a half hours outgassing. 
And if you just look at the volume of gas that's coming out of that battery, you get an idea of the importance of the vent capacity of the battery. Now what was interesting is that the flammable gas exiting that vehicle underwater, um, the, the gases caught fire on the surface of the water and they sat there and burned for that same four and a half hours. They needed an ignition source and it's very likely that it was a 12 volt sort of uh, arcing that caused the ignition to create the fire. So the vehicle, after having burned for four and a half hours, you could barely tell that it had any damage at all from the fire. You had to actually open up the bottom of the battery pack where you have access to the pyro fuses to see that it was all charred on the inside. So it was very easy to confirm that it had caught fire. How extensive the fire damage was throughout the pack, it remains unknown. So very interesting to note that the flood ports on that vehicle, uh, again, there were penthouse mounted flood ports. They were all open as you would expect them to and they were dried out and they did not close. So the question is, is that a cause or an effect? When you have a vehicle that catches fire from being inundated with salt water, it appears to be a function of a number of variables, not the least of which would be how uh, saline is the water, how much conductivity does it have? Pure water doesn't have much conductivity at all. And then how much of that water did you get? What was the state of charge of the battery, uh, et cetera? So this whole notion of will it catch fire or not remains sort of a uh, dark area of the science that's still in discovery, if you will. So this whole point about the flood port and uh, somebody who had a vehicle that regularly launched into a, a boat ramp situation, could it be that at one point the flood port opened up from a previous excursion and then remained open? And then once it was open, it became a source for an inundation, in a, you know, a huge ingress, flood yeah. of ingress. And that could be the difference between the first time when it went in and it got a couple of tablespoons or a few cups of water and the second time where it was completely inundated. Yeah, because water. they lost control of the car and the car basically was submerged. But the story I want you to say is what happened when it was submerged, the screen, the doors, everything. Oh yes, so the, uh, the, the users of the vehicle reported that the vehicle notified them of the impending doom of their situation. There wasn't a clean description of what the screen said, but it notified the driver that she should leave immediately. Three doors opened up automatically, the windows went down and uh, her husband had to get off the jet ski to retrieve her from the vehicle because she couldn't get the door open. So uh, a very interesting story that the vehicle was aware of the problem that was about to occur and uh, she was given the due notice that she needed to get out of there. At the end of the day, um, we're very impressed with many of the features, all the features actually, that we've located so far in this vehicle. Um, like I say, the, uh, the way this thing is, has been put together and the way that it's been treated differently than all the other Teslas that we've seen because this is an off-road car or an off-road truck, I should say. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I, I think that, uh, I think so far we haven't seen anything that went horribly wrong or something that needs to be brought to the attention of Tesla people. But so far this has been a one little adventure after another. I think I know why now they, they, it took so long to get this truck out. Uh, I, think that, I think that a lot of people put a lot of thought into everything that they did. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just really impressed so far. Um, by the way, um, we have figured out how to get this stuff off. Uh, so um, uh, so we'll be, we'll be showing you a little bit underneath the foam here. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to, we have a big debate as to whether we're going to sell batteries or not. Last time we lost, <laughs> we lost a lot of money um, on uh, selling batteries at an outrageously high price. So it's a lot to get these things to pieces. But anyhow, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, did you have anything else that you want? I, you know, another similarity and difference from the Model Y might be worth noting. This large area here, this sort of trough, um, you may note that there is some ventilation path through here. 
there's a little rectangular opening. So this is some ventilation capacity through these little floor blood ports we talked about. However, in the Model Y, this was filled with a black foam that was um, rather Crushed, compressible yeah. and absorbed energy. Yeah. And when you look at this sort of buffer zone, you can't help but think that this is for crash protection from side impact. Yet it's you know, apparently able to absorb the energy without that additional foam. Another interesting similarity is what looks like a piece of wood. Yeah. You know, and yeah, when they see ours on display, they always wonder if we added that piece of wood. But no, it's not wood. It's a, an extruded fiber device of some sort that is one of the structural members. It's the way you can put force here into the battery without letting the battery cells be the device that absorbs the force. So kind of a unique feature and uh, very carefully designed by its appearance. Yep. And there you have it. Boys and girls, ab absolutely everything you need to know so far about the, uh, the Tesla Cybertruck battery. And almost everything we know. <laughs> <laughs> almost. <laughs> We're keeping a couple of secrets. But at the end of the day, thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned to Monroe Live for more Cybertruck adventures. Thank you.